and a very good evening to you wherever you are. Welcome to Bible study. Now we're hoping, we're praying, we're believing that God will speak to us all in a very profound and deep way. That's my prayer for myself as well as for you as well. Well, this has been a momentous day in Australia and wonderful things have happened and exciting things too. The return of a little girl that we'd prayed for for nearly three weeks to her parents and seemingly unscathed and we praise God. Oh, how we praise God for that. Well, we've uh, had a wonderful day here in Townsville. It's been a lovely, lovely uh, day, a spring day, and a little warm, but not too much. And so we're just going to offer the Lord our praise and pray that God will bless our time together tonight. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercy. And we know that they follow us all the days of our lives. You are our shepherd and you bring us into green pastures. You bed us down beside still waters and you restore our soul. We pray for any today that need restoration of mind, of spirit, and certainly of body. We thank you that you are the divine healer on every level. And tonight we're going to just gaze at your word and appropriate it. We're going to yield to it. And we want the spirit of God to quicken us all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, praise God. I'm going to turn to a marvelous a psalm it's the psalm of deliverance, of testimony. It's Psalm 103. And it starts in a very familiar way. You're probably able to, maybe, uh, without looking at the Bible, be able to quote it. It says simply these words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Get this who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. You and I as believers are principally blessed in three ways. And these are experiences in our day-to-day -day living. If we neglect any one of them, our life is askew. It's not balanced. So what are the three principal ingredients of a true disciple, a follower of Jesus, a believer in him? The first, we are called. And then secondly, we are crucified with Christ. And of course, the scripture says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we are called, we are crucified with Christ. Our old nature is dying daily because we have offered ourselves in dedication to the Lord as he dedicated himself to our well-being, our redemption, our salvation, and in turn and response, we give ourselves taking up our cross and daily following him. So we're called, we're crucified, but we are also crowned. He crowns our life, our whole being with loving kindness. And if you can stop long enough, to just review your life 
from where you've been to what you are, from where you've come from to where you are now standing in him, you're going to say, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvellous in my eyes. I'm sure you'd say that and I know you'd believe it because it's all so true. Crowned. That's a very important word. We are called, we are crucified with Christ and we are crowned. And the loving favour, the loving kindness is all around us, enveloping us, filling us, flowing into our lives. And that is what we should expect. Now, the New Testament talks a lot about this crowning. And we find in the first chapter of the book of the Revelation a tremendous statement there. And we're going to turn to that right away. Revelation and chapter 1. This is a marvellous saying. And here is what the Lord says. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, verse 5, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and unto his Father. We are before the Father as kings. We have a designated authority. We are enjoying the authority of relationship, the authority of being sons of God. And of course, that's what John says back in the gospel. And he says, We are sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know one thing. When we see him, we will be like him. He has lifted us from the dregs and the gutters and the slime pits and the darkness and the rock of offense and the hell that we were bound for, and he has made us kings and priests unto our God. How wonderful that is. And that's what it says here in verse 5. He has made us, verse 6, kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Now the Bible talks a lot about the fact that we are in Christ blessed with all the blessings of the kingdom on every level. Let me just digress for a moment. A number of years ago, well over 10, we laughed and laughed at one of the comedies out of Hollywood. It was called about dogs and cats. And there was this ruthless old Persian cat and she victimised different animals that sort of trembled in her presence. And she said to one of her victims, stand still while I crush you. Why, said the poor little victim, because I hate you. Now that cat (laughs) symbolises the nature to me of Satan himself. Stand still while I crush you. And many people are listening and are subservient to and take on board the accusations of the enemy and they are embedded in the falsification of Satan, the lies that he brings. You're nothing. You're nobody. You'll never succeed. You'll never amount to anything. God doesn't love you. He hates you. He's angry with you. He's displeased with you. You'll never make it. You'll never have the anointing other people have had. Are those terrible 
terrible statements familiar to you? Well, many people feel that because the enemy has somehow bound them up circumstantially, spiritually, and it's virtually a case of stand still while I crush you. They're put in a vice of fear and unbelief and then all this spewing out of hell comes and envelops them, entombs them, and keeps them bound. Well, I want to tell you that Jesus says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still while I crown you. And the crowning, as we read before in that wonderful scripture, Psalm 103, verse 4, is crowned with the loving kindness of God. It's a state of being. And, of course, the scripture speaks much about it. Now, if we were turned, uh, we, if we would turn to 1 Corinthians, we have the Apostle Paul addressing a church that he loved very dearly and he knew very, very intimately. And in the fourth chapter, he makes a remarkable statement. And the other day in my quiet time, I'm reading through Corinthians at the moment in my Bible reading guide, and I read this wonderful statement in verse 8 and he speaks to the believers now ye are full now you are rich you have reigned as kings without us and I would to God you did reign that we also might reign with you now, what does that mean? Well, it means something very interesting contextually, but I want to bring it to an application in our own lives. God has blessed you and me, bringing us into this wonderful plane of total victory over Satan, over sin, over the world system, over the flesh. And if we can stand still, and allow that crowning to come to our mind and our understanding, we will remember the wonderful words of Paul when he says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. How can you be more than a conqueror? I mean, you're a conqueror. You've won. The victory is yours. How can you be more than a conqueror? Well, a conqueror is one that has won the battle through sheer determination and being able to overcome his or her enemy. And it's been a battle, and it's been tough, and it's been bloodied, and it's been not without woundings. But we're more than conquerors. Why? Because, you see, our victory is not because of any battle we have fought, but the ultimate battle that Christ has fought and won. When he cried, it is finished, Satan knew that he was finished. And we stand in that victory. We stand in that triumph. And we begin to rule and reign over those enemies that are arrayed deliberately against us. The flesh within us, the demonic hordes about us, the spirit of the world that hates us, the terrible usurper of men's soul who no longer owns us, Satan himself. And the Bible says that we are no longer his plaything. And sin shall not have dominion over us. Why? Because we are reigning. And Paul says to the Corinthian church, who were fraught with all kinds of upheavals, oh, he says here in verse 8, you are full, you are rich, you have reigned as kings, and I would to God that you do reign, that you 
uh, express that reign and live it to the full and absolutely exploit this wonderful grace of God and loving kindness that's upon you so that you can come against those things that ordinarily and in the past have destroyed you. How are you going in your walking with God and reigning in and from his resources, his glory and his word? Romans chapter 5 is a remarkable scripture because, as with the book of Romans in its entirety, it gives us a view of what it is to be saved, what it is to be a Christian. And Romans chapter 5, and let me see, verse 16. We'll go to verse 16. And here he speaks about the contrast between what we were in sin as a result of Adam's fall and our complicity in that, our experience, our darkness, our stumbling in sin and blindness, he says, uh, uh, you know, we have received the free gift of many offences unto justification. That's in verse 16. The free gift even though we had many offences, we had violated the holy law of God, we had sinned, we had fallen short, Romans 3.23, we had fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, the Bible says. No, not one. And we know that. We know that we were lost. Uh, you can't be saved until you recognise that you were lost and without, without a cleansing. And so that's why we call upon the name of the Lord, that we might be saved. For verse 17, if by one man's offence, that's Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. When we were young, we were admonished and encouraged to give your heart to Jesus. Well, it was virtually speaking about opening our heart, opening our inner being, opening our soul, and allowing our spirit to be quickened by the Spirit of God. Christ came in to our heart and life. And remember that lovely old hymn, What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. And when he did, he came as King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he came with authority and power to save, to reign, to rule, to set up divine, eternal government within our hearts. And so as one man's sin brought chaos and darkness and guilt and shame and habitual sin, so by receiving Jesus, we've received eternal life. And the Bible says this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. And he that has not the son of God has not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. For by or if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They will, or they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now, there is no hope of you ruling, reigning, and triumphing and getting the victory and enjoying the conquering life without Jesus Christ being Lord within your heart. 
Therefore, verse 18, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's absolutely amazing. Now, I want to read it to you in the paraphrased uh, edition of J.B. Phillips. And we read this wonderful scripture that we've just read. And it's verse 17. For if one man's offence meant that men should be slaves to death all their lives, it is a far greater thing that through another man, Jesus Christ, men, by their acceptance of his more than sufficient grace and righteousness, should live all their lives like kings. <laughs> I love that. They should live all their lives like kings. Now, the Amplified Version says pretty beautifully, I think, the same verse. So what verse was that? Verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass or lapse and offence, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, the unmerited favour and the free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with himself, they will reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. I think that is so amazing. The dignity of life that we have in Christ is the freedom that we enjoy. And so Romans 8, chapter 30 is very exciting. If we turn across to that, we find these words. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And then he goes on to say in verse 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So you see, we are enveloped in the victory of God. So if God is for us, the devil can taunt, the devil can challenge, the devil can confront, the devil can accuse. But as Revelation chapter 12 tells us, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. We are therefore ruling. We are therefore enjoying the blessing of being crowned with loving kindness. We are living as kings. Now, I just praise God for that because that's what I believe your life and my life should be. We should be abiding in his peace, abiding in his grace, and abiding in his love. Now, listen to this. This is J.B. Phillips again. And I'm going to read three verses and I think you'll love them. From verse 28 to 30. We know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. God in his foreknowledge chose them to bear the family likeness of his son that he might be the eldest of a family of many brothers. He chose them long ago 
when the time came, he called them. You know, the time came when God called you. How marvelous it is. Oh, that the eyes of our understanding would be open, that we could understand, that we could revel, that we could live in expectation of these things being made real in our lives and through our lives. Eunice had a, an experience today. She went into the shopping centre and she picked up some uh, antihistamine tablets for me at the chemist. And when she was talking to the girl, the girl was very affable, very helpful. A girl in her young uh, years, maybe 22, 25 at the most, and chatting away and very, very helpful. So Eunice, uh, not because she was helpful, but because she sensed the girl was open, she reached into a bag and took out a gospel tract and handed it to the girl. And she said to the girl, I'd like you to know how much Jesus loves you. And the girl looked at her, looked at the tract. She said, did you write this? She said, no, no, I didn't design it. Friends in Melbourne did. She said, I am longing to meet someone that can help me. I am wanting to be baptised. You see, Eunice, whether she knew it or not, being a king's child was led. And this is the practical outworking of what we have just read. Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. God in his foreknowledge chose them to bear the family likeness of his son, that he might be the eldest of a family of many brothers. He chose them long ago. When the time came, he called them. You see, it was today that that girl was called the next part of her journey. She had this desire, which was the yearning of the Holy Spirit within her, yearning to please God, yearning to follow the Lord, yearning to obey his word. Somehow, some way in the development of her life, she's been taught the scriptures. And now by the grace and the moving of the Spirit of God, today was a day of linkage with the next step the next era of her life. The Bible says here that in making us righteous in his sight, which he does when we receive Christ, we are lifted to the splendor of life as his sons. Lifted to the splendor of life as his sons. Oh, dear friends, how wonderful is that? This, this wonderful experience. Can we just go back to those three key words? The first is that we are called. Well, the Bible tells us he's called us out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. In the process of yielding ourselves to him, he calls us to crucify the old life, to kill off deliberately by faith the old life, that we might truly be able to say that we are, being in Christ, a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ... He's a new creature or new creation. Old things are passed away and behold, the new has come. And that's where we change. Not the struggle of trying to overcome in our own strength to please God. That's the law. And it never worked. It brought us into condemnation. It brought us into failure. It brought us into frustration. But Christ in you is the hope of glory. He does the work. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. 
And so we are crucified with Christ. And then in that process of being crucified with him, we are crowned with the splendor of this heavenly dignity that he has purchased for us. There should be a change in every believer's life. There should be a change in demeanour. There should be a change in the manner of speech. It should be evident there's a change in our morality. We've changed. We've come out of darkness into his most marvellous light. We've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Old things are passed away. And daily, when we are confronted with our old nature and flesh and the usual way of doing things that is not pleasing to the Lord, we let that die. And we say no to sin and no to Satan and no to the flesh. And we say yes to the Spirit of God. And every time... We gain victory in him and by him we are crowned. You see, there is an overcomer's crown. That's what the Bible says. An overcomer's crown. In concluding tonight, our relationship to Christ and our role, our calling in his name is very, very clear. We are in Christ granted divine authority. Now that doesn't give us an authority to do our own thing and to decree new laws and new ways of doing us and it doesn't make us a dictator. It just means that God is sharing his glory. Now there is a beautiful scripture that he says he is going to do for each and every one of us. And that is that he that overcomes will be given a crown of light. Isn't that wonderful? Have you enjoyed that? Now, uh, my little iPad has gone on the blink. That's nothing. Uh, we can fix that probably two days' time. But uh, this message is so real to me, I know exactly what I want to say. And it's simply this, that God has given us designated authority. He has said, I will build the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the church is made up of men and women, just like you, just like me, who were nothing, who were bound in sin, and now we are saints of God. But we have with that authority a sublime humility. We have authority, but we have humility. Why do we have humility? Because, you see, we are not what we are by anything we have done, but it's because of him. Now, Titus 3, chapter 3 and verse 5 says, it's not the works of righteousness that we have done, it's his mercy that saved us. Isn't that wonderful? His mercy saved us. So are you enjoying the mercy of God? Because that's where we're at. That's where God has poured his grace upon you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. And you'll never be able to pay adequately for it. No, it's this loving kindness. So... While we are living in authority over sin, over Satan, over the world, over, over error, over the lies of the enemy, over the misconceptions and the obsessions of the flesh, we've got victory over that. We say, well, this victory that I have is not my will, it's not my mind, it's not my attitude, it's the grace of God. God has done this for me, and I praise him for it. And that's what God wants to do 
in your life. He wants to help you to exert authority. Say, for instance, Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, it shall be done by you. If two of you shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done of my Father. You shall say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. If you truly believe, it will be done. In other words, we will face impossible situations and see the Lord bring great victory and great blessing. Sometimes it's a battle because, you know, the Bible says there are times when kings go forth to war. And, you know, we are called not only to enjoy authority, but what use is that if we're not going to exert it? And where do you exert it? On the battlefield. And that's what Ephesians 6 is all about. How we take on the armour of God, fully clad, fully protected, invincible. And we have as our weaponry the sword of the Spirit. And we go forward with the shield of faith, totally armoured, our thinking is covered our breastplate that's our attitudes our heart is covered our feet are secure in the journey towards further victories and we face many battles and we face many a foe and many times we will see situations where we think oh my goodness me what a terrible thing we're faced with here and then we start rising up in prayer can I ask you something very, very personal? And because I'm not personally, physically with you, you uh, won't feel terribly put on the spot. But when battles rage, what is your attitude? When things come at you and you're overwhelmed by that, how do you react? Do you take on the armour of God? Do you persevere? Do you take on Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and the first verses where men should always pray and not faint? Or do you collapse in a heap? Do you fight out of the resources that are really the flesh? No, crucify that. Say, I am not going to rely on my mind. I'm not going to rely even on my experience or my opinion or my hopes and ambitions and desires and will. I am going to rely on the word from the throne. And you have come up into the level where the divine strategy is made known. And you begin to go forth into battle. You know, King David squandered his royal kingship. Because in 2 Samuel, the Bible tells us that when kings go forth to battle, he stayed at home and became idle. And in that idleness, sin began to predominate. And his natural lusts and desires came to the surface. He saw Bathsheba and his heart lusted for her. She was the wife of another innocent man who was at the front fighting for Israel. And so was the evil that David succumbed to that he not only committed adultery, and there was a child conceived as a result. But he was complicit in the murder of Uriah. And through that, all hell broke loose in his life. Even though he repented, there were consequences that kept coming. The upheaval in his family, because it was the family that he sinned against. Bathsheba and her family and Uriah and his own family the trust of his wives and of his children. And chaos reigned. And you know, we need to remember that kings go forth to battle, but we go forward with the assurance that we have the victory. We have authority, we have humility, and we have certainty. And we have certainty 
that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, my dear friends, I'm bringing the study to a close tonight so that you can have a pleasant evening. And I trust you have seen on the screen the outline of the message tonight. There are some things we could have gone into. We could have talked further about the complementary ministry of the believer, which is not only the authority of kings, but the ministry of the priest. We are priests as believers. We, there is a priesthood of the believers as there is a kingship of believers, authority and ministry. And um, we didn't have time for that. But we will do that some other time. If ever there was a day and ever there was an era where we needed to know the truth about those three areas of our lives that we should be pursuing, our calling, the crucifixion of the old life and the crowning of the glory and the blessing and the authority and the kingship of the believer, it's now. You see, we are in the end times. We are in the last days. We are in the very edge of the coming of the Lord. And the Bible says there will be many that fall away. Why do people fall away? Because they live habitually in the resources of their past life. I'm determined not to do that. I am determined to... Honour the calling, crucify the flesh, and allow the glory of God, the loving kindness of God, the authority of the King to come upon me so that I am able to pray without ceasing, to pray with power, determination, and authority, and see kingdoms subdued, the mouths of lions stop, and wonderful things happening in the name of Jesus. Good night, dear friends, and I trust you'll be with us next Sunday morning. I'll be bringing the message at church, and uh, you can watch us online from 10 o'clock in the morning uh, when we have simple worship. Uh, the coming of the Lord is honoured in the communion, and then, of course, we have the Word of God. That's every Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Queensland time. And so we just bid you a farewell and a great God bless you. And uh, we look forward to being with you again and again and again until Jesus comes or takes us home. God bless you.